Hello and welcome to another episode of Ancient Warfare Answers. With me today is Murray Dahm, the assistant editor of Ancient Warfare magazine, and I am Jasper Orthuis. I'm the editor of the magazine. And today we are answering a question from Jay Soth, and he wants to know how is all the intense cavalry action possible in ancient history? The Thessalian diamond formation charge, companion cavalry, the Midian light cavalry, and all of that without the use of the stirrup or more modern saddle technology. If it's all with rope or cord and thigh gripping, then they must have had some seriously chiseled legs. Well, all the legs on all the sculptures chiseled, but um, by definition, I suppose. But uh, Murray maybe has a better question, uh, answer than that one. I think I think um, chiseled is probably right, but also, um, you know, our understanding of, of what the ancients could achieve with the saddles that they had um, is, you know, academics for a long time. Uh, considered that they wouldn't be able to achieve a great deal with a, with a saddle that wasn't uh, stirruped or wasn't a modern saddle. And we think now that, in fact, they were probably highly capable of all sorts of uh, actions on such saddles without stirrups, whether it be gripping with the thighs or, you know, when you look at uh, Native American horse riding or any any culture that hasn't uh, used the stirrup, the, they are they evolve into very, very capable cavalrymen. Um, the types of actions that, that cavalry required uh, early on, of course, the, the Greek cavalry are, are a very sort of small force. We, we aren't sure with the uh, whether hoplites originally rode to battle and then dismounted to fight as cavalry, whether, you know, the image that you get in the Iliad of, of even with chariots, the, the basically a battle taxi. Uh, there's still debate as to whether that's a real picture or not. Um, and so the idea, of course, that actual cavalry, uh, which survive in the Hippias and, uh, you know, in Rome, you've got the Equites classes. So it's a wealth class, uh, wealthy enough to be able to afford horses that stays in, in uh, both cultures, which become predominantly uh heavy infantry based and so that those people who remain cavalry um, are very small in number and also the sort of actions that cavalry are required to do we tend to think are scouting reconnaissance uh, sometimes mixing it up with other cavalry forces on the battlefield but that they would always be melee not sort of intense melee but sort of missile fire um, so whether it be javelins or, or horse archers and you know, that they they sort of scout around the edges and then, of course, they chase down fleeing enemies. Most of the archaeological depictions of cavalry uh, show them with swords. Uh, they tend to be unarmored. They also tend to be uh, not wearing helmets and they also tend to be not using shields. So uh, most of the archaeological depictions of, of cavalry are unarmored horsemen, with swords and javelins or spears. So uh, they're, they're not suited for intense battle. When that starts to come in, and we think that, that intense cavalry battle starts to come in, in just prior to the age of Alexander, um, so that Alexander and his cavalry are charging home as it was, um, in the Battle of uh, Galgamela and Issus and Granicus. So, you know, with the Roman uh, cavalry as well, you've got the same sort of thing. You've got the equites there. And again, the, the numbers of cavalry involved in the legions are very small. Um, and cavalry, Roman cavalry is notorious, as we've discussed in, in an earlier issue, Roman cavalry is notoriously, uh, has a very bad reputation. And even when Rome comes across good cavalry forces such as those from Numidia, uh, they again are light skirmishing cavalry who who fly around the flanks and uh, fire missiles and then flee uh, enemies who are running away. And, you know, even Julius Caesar is using Numidian cavalry in uh, in Gaul and and in the in the civil wars. So that sort of what cavalry did is not what we picture cavalry doing. The, the, the picture of heavy cavalry charging home, uh, which we'll look at in a sort of a, a separate question, isn't what the cavalry of 
um, the sort of the classical period, both in terms of the Greek hoplite and the the Roman legion, the the, the middle Republican legions. That's not what cavalry did. They were uh, they were cer certainly a source of status and wealth um, and and symbols of those things. But on the battlefield, their role was less. What's the word? Not. Hmm, it's interesting because I'm thinking Alcibiades. See, Alcibiades at the Battle of Delium, he's on horseback, so he's part of the he's part of the Athenian cavalry at the Battle of Delium. So there's still status to being a cavalryman, um, and we have these fabulous uh, tombstones of, of Greek cavalry and Athenian cavalry, but it's not the it's not the mainstay of of the, the either uh, Greek or Roman warfare. So it's it's an interesting sort of double-edged sword. On the one hand, it's status and wealth, and on the other, it's like, yes, but you're not really the main thrust of our of our, of our our armed forces, are you? Well, what do you think, yes? Uh, you know, I always just, for me, it's natural to go to the Romans, and then they, they do develop, um, or develop, They, I think they nick from Celtic cavalry, an improved saddle um, that does, as, as reenactors have attested, uh, allow for a much uh, safer seat, um, which allows um, uh, Roman cavalry from what's that? Uh, I think it's pretty comes in a very late Republican period um, to do all kinds of maneuvers um, and um, and tactical evolutions in a um, apparently fairly comfortably and, and easy without stirrups. Um, they're still mostly not. Uh, you know, uh, head-on shock cavalry. Uh, most Roman cavalry um, just uses javelins. Um, uh, although later on, of course, you do they they um, adopt some of the um, uh, cataphract cavalry from the east, uh, and it becomes it can become a, a large army. And in the late Roman army, of course, it, they become very important. Um, but then you're talking hundreds of years after this question, uh, um, the period uh, that this question is about, really. Yeah, well, you've got the four-horned saddle, haven't you? Yes, exactly. That's, that's the, that, that is the, um, the saddle that comes in. You've later got what they call the step saddle. That, that, that comes in, too, through the, yes. through the Gothic tribes. Um, again, and we think that that might be in the second and third centuries, even. Um, and again, it's tricky because the, a lot of the Gothic cavalry, the... The, the, you know, the victory at Adrianople is essentially achieved by missile cavalry who surround the Roman legions at Adrianople. Um, so it's, it's you know, by then there are heavy cavalry. You know, they're taken from the Sarmatians and the, the, the Sassanid Persians, and you've got the cataphracts and the Clibinari, but you've also still got cavalry who are light, skirmishing, missile-firing raiders. Yeah. It, it's the the contrast is kind of interesting if you think about it. By the time that the, the improved saddles come in, and presumably it's an easier seat and easier to ride, most of the cavalry um, is skirmishing cavalry, while the you know especially the Macedonian cavalry that we think of the companion cavalry, um, you know Sarissophor and, and and cavalrymen like that are apparently. Uh, armed with uh, thrusting spears, uh, but have to do this indeed with um, strong thighs. Uh, no, no, no. I was, I was agreeing indeed with the strong thighs. So. All right. <laughs> well, I think we'll leave it at that. <laughs> See you next time. We'll leave it on. We'll leave it on strong Greek thighs. Yes, chiseled thighs.